All right, so our next speaker is Kyle Varner. And he's a physician who um, has done his own stint of medical tourism. So we brought him in to tell you about that. And he's, uh, he actually went to Antigua College of Medicine to get his MD. He did his residency at uh, Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu. I'm really jealous. Uh, he's board certified in internal medicine and the founder and director, director of Elite Locum Tenens, a medical staffing firm specializing in connecting quality hospital personnel with understaffed hospitals. I think that's a great thing to do. He practices medicine both in Spokane, Washington, and Anchorage, Alaska. And he's gone from the wonderful beauty and heat of Honolulu to the frozen north. <laughs> so let's welcome Kyle Varner. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's always great to be uh, in a room full of people who value reason and liberty, and uh, today's talks have really uh, been eye-opening, uh, even for me, especially Mary's talk about a lot of these tests uh, for cancer diagnostics, uh, which were tests I had never heard of, and that should put up some red flags since I see and treat cancer patients every day. I should not be hearing new things uh, at a conference, but I am. And that brings me to the point that American medicine is in shackles. I am convinced that patients in American hospitals are not receiving the best care available in the world, that they are receiving cookie cutter medicine. We are not the cutting edge, we're a dull blade that is doing things that are considered by a bureaucratic system to be safe, uh, and that is uh, more interested in following cookie cutter guidelines than it is in obtaining optimum outcomes for our patients. A lot of reasons that I've listed up here. The FDA, which Mary went into uh, at length. We've also got the DEA that has chosen a specific group of drugs, uh, called them scheduled substances, and threatened doctors for using them in an off-label way. Just as one example, there's a great drug called modafinil that's approved for uh, things like narcolepsy or shift work sleep disorders, but is also a very potent nootropic, but a physician could never tell their patients that or could never prescribe it for that purpose or they would risk going to jail. In American medical culture, we defer to experts in a pathological way. The number of times I have had a discussion or a debate with a colleague, and the discussion was shut down by someone either citing a guideline or saying that, well, the cardiologist said you should do this. Uh, and my response was, yeah, but that guy's an idiot. You know, it, it doesn't work. He's a cardiologist. He's got three years more training than you. You can't question him. Yeah, it, it's a cultural practice in medicine today, and it prevents you from getting the best care. Uh, we have guidelines and third-party payers, and that system has obviously driven the price of care through the roof of the United States. Um, and uh, it's also meant that a lot of autonomy is stripped away from the doctor and the patient. Because if the insurance company won't pay, and the out-of-pocket price is $100,000, there aren't a whole lot of people out there who are going to be able to or willing to make that decision. Lastly, we have practice guidelines from specialty societies. They're double-edged swords. Uh, on the one hand, they can provide helpful advice. It's really nice to have a group of experts sit down and uh, go through all the available evidence and give you the recommendations. On the other hand, it's also a threat because it's a not-so-subtle way of telling you if you practice medicine in any way other than this, there will be someone willing to testify against you, and they will cite the guidelines. And you don't really have a lot of security in being able to expect that your jury is going to understand your nuanced interpretation of the literature in light of a guideline that may not be based on high quality evidence. And I can tell you, over and over again in medicine, people practice according to the guidelines when 
it's really far beyond the limitations of the guideline for that case. So what we have is centrally planned medicine in America. Half of our medical system may be nominally uh, in the private sector, but it's still subject to a lot of Soviet-style central planning. And uh, as a result, uh, I think everyone here realizes central planning leads to failures, bread lines in the Soviet Union, and in the United States, lots and lots of people are suffering in very bad ways. So the American medical system failed me, and I took matters into my own hands. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about that story. Uh, for my entire life, from about the age of five, I suffered from morbid obesity. Um, and I, I tried and tried to fix that with diet and exercise. I saw doctors and nutritionists and personal trainers and was told, in those exact words, put down the cupcakes. Go to the gym, watch what you eat. I was lectured that I'd be at high risk of diabetes, stroke, heart attack, cancer. All those things that I already knew to be the case. I succeeded at losing some weight and then I would gain it back. And I was miserable and because I had been talked down to so much and so forth, I felt horrible about that. And in the end, doctors would just tell me I had to have more discipline. <laughs> things were failing. And uh, it, it was something that, that was really contributing to a lot of misery in my life. So I was 295 pounds, and uh, about 15 times I dieted and exercised. I was just given uh, a message of, of, well, shame on you from the doctors. So I decided, hey, 15 uh, separate <laughs> failures at diet and exercise, 295 pounds, it's time to take a more radical step. I decided I needed uh, bariatric surgery. These were uh, my reasons. I want to point out, about 99% of people who suffer from morbid obesity and try diet and exercise alone fail. Um, there's a great, uh, a number of great studies that show uh, that these diet and exercise interventions don't lead to long-term sustained weight loss. I didn't want to continue living an impaired life. Unfortunately, in the United States, bariatric surgery is actually restricted, and I didn't meet the criteria. So these are the criteria published by all of the major societies, backed up by guidelines. You must have a BMI greater than 40 kilograms per meter squared, or be between 35 and 39, with at least one serious comorbidity. That would be something like diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, Pickwickian syndrome, so on and so forth. I didn't have any comorbidities. I was certain to develop them, but I didn't have them at that time. American medicine had essentially decided for me that I couldn't have bariatric surgery. Uh, there was actually a case at the hospital where I did my residency of a, a bariatric surgeon who performed a surgery on a patient who had, uh, in the preoperative uh, program, lost enough weight not to qualify. And she had some complications and she said, well, yeah, but you shouldn't have performed the surgery. They awarded that patient over $4 million. The case is called Matthias versus Texas, and uh, it served as a warning to doctors who practice outside of clinical guidelines. You can and will be sued. So that was the first obstacle. I just wasn't in the guidelines, even though I felt that was what I needed. Patient autonomy, patient choice isn't uh, at the forefront of American medical values. So, um, what I did is I went to Tijuana. That is a picture of my surgeon, Dr. Fernando Govia Garcia. Really great guy. And um, I had a wonderful experience. I got picked up at the airport in uh, San Diego and uh, driven by a private driver to my hotel. The next day I was picked up at the hotel and taken to the hospital where I had a private room complete with a flat screen TV, uh, an excellent view. Uh, my mother was with me, she was allowed to stay there the entire time. They even had a, an extra bed, a full bed for her in the hospital room. I had one to one, one nurse to me the entire time I was there. You won't find that in an American hospital. So they had 24-7 translators available. I happened to speak Spanish, so it wasn't necessary, but it was nice uh, to have 
uh, for patients who didn't uh, have that. Uh, I felt like I had excellent medical care. And I'm going to get into a few reasons why I had excellent medical care. But if we go back, uh, as I forward, back a couple of slides, just take a look. That's me prior to the surgery, a few years before the surgery. This is me now. I'm very, very pleased with the outcome I received. So let's compare what I got in Mexico versus what I could have looked forward to if I had weighed maybe another 20 pounds heavier in the United States. So I paid $5,000. It was all inclusive. That was all. In the US, it would have been around $30,000 at the time uh, when I did my own research. I decided what pre and post operative programs I wanted to participate in. You will seldom find a bariatric surgeon in the United States willing to operate on someone without having at least a psychological evaluation, a prolonged preoperative diet and exercise program, and all kinds of hoops through which the patient must jump. If your insurance covers it in the United States, you can expect a substantial out of pocket component, and you can expect a lot of hoops. It may take you six months to a year just to get the pre-approval. I didn't need any pre-approval. I went online, bought a plane ticket, I went to Tijuana, and I got what I decided I needed. I made my choice. I'm very happy with it. So it's not only bariatric surgery that you can have done abroad. You can have just about anything done abroad. Um, and so I want to just go through some costs, because uh, the cost of medical care is one of the most difficult things about our system. When they take so much of your income for insurance and taxes and then uh, tell you, well, but when we determine you need a procedure, then you can have it. That's very nice if they determine you need it. But, um, you know, maybe your knee is bad and you'd like to get it replaced, but the insurance company insists you have a few more steroid injections and suffer for another year or two before they're going to approve the knee replacement. Uh, you don't have many options. But you actually might. So the first procedure up here, coronary artery bypass grafting. Uh, that's a heart bypass. You can have that done in Mexico for about 7,500 bucks. In the United States, healthcarebluebook.com, which is a great that kind of source to tell you the price, it says that that would be about $34,139. I don't actually uh, think you'd be able to find a hospital to offer you that cash price. If you've ever tried to pay cash for anything in the United States, uh, you will notice incredibly inflated prices, people who don't know what the prices are, uh, and, and it's a very convoluted system. Now, there, there's a, um, an outpatient surgery center called Surgery Center of Oklahoma that uh, does offer uh, uh, cash prices and cash packages for a number of procedures, and uh, they, they offer really fair prices, but they're the only ones in the entire country I know of. So a vertical sleeve gastrectomy, that's what I had. Uh, and now, uh, Healthcare Blue Book says it's $15,000. When I went um, shopping for it, I couldn't find anyone charging less than 30, but uh, 5,000 versus 15,000 is still a significant difference. Uh, cardiac catheterization with a stent, $4,500 in Mexico versus $14,000 in the United States. Knee replacement, 6,100 versus 24,000. Spinal fusion, 7,500 versus 35,000. Uh, gender reassignment is a, a, an important one to note here because Thailand is actually the world capital of it with a lot of really experienced surgeons. I couldn't really put prices there because there are so many different procedures uh, based on what the person's wanting to have done, but uh, suffice it to say that you're going to find expertise that's world renowned and prices that are a lot lower. And if you look at the prices in uh, Mexico or other parts of the world, there are prices people can afford, i.e. they're less than a used car. Uh, so this is, a, this is something that opens up doors for a lot of people. When your insurance company or the healthcare guidelines in the United States say you can't have something, the truth is maybe you can. Of course, uh, it's not all uh, happy stories and roses. Complications happen, and there are confidence men out there. And uh, you have to protect yourself. And so the very first thing I'm going to tell you about protecting yourself as caveat emptor. Proceed with your eyes open, 
and uh, do your own due diligence. And I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about how you can go about doing your own due diligence. But my first piece of advice is know what you want when you go shopping. You want a knee replacement. You probably shouldn't let someone try to upsell you on a stem cell therapy for your knee. Uh, know what you want by having done your research and then go out and look for it. You need to know what the potential complications are, what the probabilities of those complications occurring are, and what you will do if you have a complication. Anytime you have a medical procedure, you can have a complication. Uh, there are uh, insurance plans out there uh, where when you're buying a medical tourism package, you can pay an extra fee for an insurance package that will uh, cover your care in the case of complications, or maybe you have the money in the bank and you're willing to risk it and uh, pay for care and complications. There are different ways. You need to have that conversation with your surgeon. You need to have a plan for yourself. You need to make a good choice of who your surgeon or doctor is and the facility they're operating under, and I'll talk about that in just a moment in more detail. Uh, and lastly, you want to consider the language factors and also uh, any potential cultural uh, barriers uh, that you may have uh, complicating your care depending on what you need, who you are, and so forth. But uh, when you're choosing a surgeon, a few things that are very important. And the first one is that person's experience. And I don't mean did they do their residency or training at some prestigious fancy school or even what their primary specialty is. I mean, how many of that procedures have you done? So Dr. Garcia had done about 5,000 cases when he did my case. Now most bariatric surgeons in the United States are also general surgeons with a general surgery practice. Dr. Garcia gets up every day and lives and breathes bariatric surgery and has done more cases than the vast majority of bariatric surgeons in the United States. If there's a complication, he's seen it and he knows how to manage it. So I felt very comfortable because of his skills. Uh, you develop skills by doing something over and over again. So if there's one thing to take away, look at someone's case volume. And that's going to tell you a lot about how skilled they are. Um, and next, you need to ask about the facility. Some people are performing bariatric surgery in uh, ambulatory surgery centers. Maybe it's located in a strip mall. Other people are performing them in hospitals fully equipped with ICU facilities. Obviously, if something goes wrong, it's nice to have an ICU there, but you need to make the determination of uh, how important that is to you because having it done at a hospital would be more. And, and this is obviously going to depend on uh, what procedure you're having done. If you're having coronary artery bypass grafting, no one's even going to attempt that in an ambulatory surgery center. But if you were having a knee replacement, someone might. And so you need to kind of make that decision. Uh, there is uh, an organization called the Joint Commission uh, which accredits hospitals in the United States. Uh, they also have an international um, uh, body which uh, accredits some hospitals internationally. Uh, I think that uh, probably looking to have major procedures done at an accredited hospital is probably a good idea because you have had someone look and see that they do have, uh, for example, um, uh, competency requirements for their staff. They do have things like working fire alarm systems and they have a, a pretty lengthy checklist, but it, it's probably worth it. But again, you make your own decisions because you're a free person. Uh, a reputation is also something really worth looking at. Uh, for pretty much any of these surgeries, you're going to be able to find forums online where patients start talking. And I, I would advise you that where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, so I frequented these forums as, as a reader, and I've seen um, uh, different discussions about physicians that, you know, it, when I, during the time I was looking at having my surgery, there was one surgeon who was charging 4500 instead of 5000 and I looked into him and I started seeing people complaining both about bad outcomes and about uh, poor demeanor. And so I looked into it a little more and uh, I got on the phone and I made some calls to people in Mexico and uh, started asking them about uh, him, not necessarily saying that I was a, a potential patient and I found out that this guy was actually an alcoholic and he no longer practices medicine. But uh, it's important to say when there's smoke, there's fire, so you have to look. Uh, and this kind of thing can and does happen in the United States too. Uh, there are companies out there, great companies and bad companies, that are medical tourism facilitators or coordinators, and um, they'll sell you an entire package. It includes the fee for the procedure, as well as accommodations and so forth. Uh, 
I used a coordinator for, uh, service, uh, that's who picked me up at the airport, took me to the hotel and so forth, it was very useful. Uh, but obviously, uh, beware, they're not doctors, don't uh, take any advice from them because they probably don't uh, necessarily know what they're talking about. Uh, and due diligence on them is important as well. Uh, every single person that I have told that I had bariatric surgery in Mexico has said, oh my god, how could you be sure that you were getting good care? Um, and I think this is actually predicated on American exceptionalism. People who live in the United States seem to think that um, everything we have here is great. It, don't eat the food south of the border. It, it's uh, a very kind of uh, ethnocentric uh, mindset, and it doesn't have any basis in uh, reality. Uh, I think everyone in this room realizes that licensure schemes are just a form of rent-seeking. Uh, for entrenched professionals, uh, and that they don't really bear any relationship to the quality of services delivered. Uh, but if you think otherwise, uh, I would just say that you are delusional. Uh, having a medical procedure performed domestically does not relieve you of your due diligence responsibilities. There are bad doctors, and there are good doctors in the U.S. There are bad hospitals, and there are good doctors. I do have good hospitals in the U.S. I've seen them both. Uh, you're the one who will pay the consequences if something goes wrong. So, if you're wise, you will do your necessary homework to make sure that you don't subject yourselves to uh, any undue risks. Uh, I, again, I would say facility accreditation is important because uh, it, uh, when a facility is accredited, it means that resources that may be necessary are in fact available. So, the last kind of bit of cold water on this is that there are no guarantees in medicine or in life. And when you go under the knife, you're taking your life into your own hands. And it's your responsibility to know what uh, the risks are, and what the benefits are, and make your own decision. And uh, I think that so frequently in the United States, we have such a paternalistic system that we're robbing people of that opportunity to take responsibility and then live or die by their own decisions. And uh, it's, it's a real shame that that's happening in the United States. Uh, lastly, whenever you have a procedure, whether it's in the United States or anywhere else in the world, your surgeon will conduct a, an informed consent procedure. And what informed consent is, is it means that they're gonna tell you everything about the procedure and make sure you agree. When you go for that, and this really applies in a hospital in the US or abroad, Nothing the surgeon says should be a surprise to you. Why? You should know all of this if you're having something done, at least electively. Um, and um, if something is a surprise, that should be a big red flag that you didn't do enough homework. And you might consider going back home and doing more remedial homework because uh, ultimately you can rely on no one other than yourself to make good decisions for you. There's a lot more than just affordable surgical procedures available abroad. There are also stem cell therapies. So uh, autologous stem cells are a little different than embryonic stem cells. They actually come from your own body, usually fat cells or bone marrow cells. And there are clinical trials all over the world evaluating stem cell therapies for a litany of uh, different uh, indications. And uh, I want to be very clear that right now we don't know what the proper role of stem cell therapy in any given disease is. And when I say proper role, I mean we don't know whether you're going to benefit or be harmed by a given stem cell therapy. Uh, and we don't know to what degree you'll benefit or when the best time to get the therapy is or even what the best form of the therapy is. It's uh, experimental. Uh, and I'm very, very hopeful for the future as we start to figure these things out, as more and better data becomes available. Uh, but for now, we don't have any FDA-approved commercial autologous stem cell therapies available in the United States. But they are available abroad, we should be aware of them, and um, we have to evaluate them on a case-by-case -case basis. So I want to just talk you through what I would do if I had heart failure. And the reason I chose heart failure as an example is because it's my bread and butter as an internist or as a hospitalist. It's something I see and treat every day, and it's something where I'm handcuffed because I can't tell my patients 
to do what I myself would do. Now, this breaks my heart. But heart failure is, a, just to, to briefly explain the pathophysiology, what I mean specifically here is systolic heart failure, meaning a failure of the pumping, uh, of the pumping function of the heart. A normal heart has what we call an ejection fraction of about 55%, meaning 55% of the blood leaves the heart when the heart pumps. In systolic failure, that number goes down and down and down until the patient dies. And there is a very standard treatment protocol, which I've tried to outline here. So we start with medical therapy. ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker plus a beta blocker. This is the first line of very established therapy. There's a newer medication called Entresto or Secubitril Valsartan. We revascularize them if possible. Sometimes uh, heart failure is due to uh, uh, ischemic heart disease. Other times it's, quote, non-ischemic with a little bit of a better uh, prognosis. But uh, if we can revascularize them and reverse the cause, we do. If it gets worse, we give them uh, an aldosterone antagonist, i.e. spironolactone. And then we place an ICD, which is uh, an uh, implantable defibrillator. So if you uh, have a cardiac arrhythmia, uh, which is what is responsible for a lot of cases of sudden death, uh, this will shock you out of it. We put, put people in cardiac rehab, and if they're a candidate, they might get a heart transplant, uh, but eventually a large, large portion of these patients end up as hospice candidates. It's not a very promising pathway because uh, the pathophysiology of heart failure is such that it itself perpetuates. Your autonomic nervous system makes it worse. So as your heart starts failing, it tries to compensate and makes it worse. And also your renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, pathway also is one of the other mechanisms by which it's made worse. But this is what I would do. I would revascularize if possible. I would definitely take maximum medical therapy, and that would be Sacubitril, Valsartan, and a beta blocker. I would do a bunch of cardiac rehab, and if I saw my ejection fraction continue to creep down before it got bad enough for me to have a defibrillator implanted in my body, I would be in the Caribbean or South America getting stem cell therapy. So they would aspirate bone marrow from me, and they would prepare it in a lab, or they would use fat cells. They would perform a cardiac catheterization and inject the cells directly into the heart. Now, the available data on this is mixed. I would characterize the decision to do this as a Hail Mary pass. Of course, when you are on a bad path, like heart failure that's progressively worsening despite maximal medical therapy, a Hail Mary pass is worth it. But realistically, I can't recommend that to my patients in the United States. I have to answer to my hospital's medical staff. I have to answer to my state medical board. I have to answer to the American Board of Internal Medicine. And what are they going to say uh, if they find out that I told a patient to go abroad and pay thirty or fifty thousand dollars to some shady stem cell clinic when I should have actually referred them to a cardiologist for a defibrillator placement? We have guidelines. We have rules. We have a Soviet-style system. So, uh, safety data is pretty good for this, but the efficacy data is weak. It may not work, or it may. I just don't know. But I can't take the money with me if I die. So, there are a lot of people out there offering stem cell therapy. And they almost all overstate their case. So uh, they also also offer different therapies uh, across centers. There's nothing standardized. So how would I choose who to go with? Well, I'd look at the available published data. I'd look at the clinical trials, and I'd see, OK, this is an area where I see the most promise. What did they do? I'd try to come up with a theory about what works and why it worked. And then I'd go find a stem cell treatment center that could try to replicate that trial's results or improve upon them if I thought I could improve upon them. So it would very much be a, a procedure of me doing very detailed review of the literature and then trying to replicate what I thought was the best uh, path forward. And that's something you will just not find uh, a doctor in the United States doing for one of their patients. But I'm here to tell you today it's what I do for myself. And uh, I think if you're a wise consumer, you would do the same thing for yourself. Uh, and by the way, anyone who had, uh, understands basic math can perform their own literature search and um, can 
can do all of that themselves. It requires no special training besides uh, basic statistics. Um, I would also uh, leave open the possibility of increasing doses, having multiple treatments. We have staying in medicine, start low and go up slow. So we start at a low dose, and then we look uh, at how the person did, and then we start to escalate if we're not getting the results we want. And I probably believe we're willing to apply that principle to stem cell therapy. So there are a lot of conditions with purported stem cell therapy. Some of them make sense and some of them don't. At ALS, we actually are having some really positive uh, results in early trials uh, in the United States even. So this is something, um, ALS, by the way, is my worst nightmare. Uh, and uh, it's something I would actually go very quickly overseas to try a stem cells treatment. Uh, and then uh, if that were to fail, uh, my next step would be to pursue physician aid in dying. Uh, Heart failure, obviously, I've discussed a lot. Multiple sclerosis, not such good evidence for that one. Uh, degenerative joint disease, pretty good evidence. There are some uh, centers offering stem cells for asthma. That makes no sense at all. There's no rational reason to believe it would work, but there are people out there advertising it. Uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, there are some promising results there. There are also uh, a lot of really good therapies that are well proven, uh, available in the United States. So uh, there's, there's a kind of a, a, a a difficult case with that, but uh, certainly in severe cases, it may be worth trying. Uh, some types of cancer have purported stem cell therapies available. Uh, I'm not convinced that there's a reason to believe that would work. Some types of autoimmune diseases and muscular dystrophy as well. Uh, again, these are probably less likely to be thought uh, to work. So uh, that brings me to kind of the first point and all of this. Ask yourself if it makes sense. Does the mechanism of therapy relate to the mechanism of the disease? If not, then it's uh, probably a bunch of rubbish. Uh, so in the United States, uh, we always want randomized double-blind clinical trials. But when that's not available, do you just sit down and die? Or do you go and make the best decision you have with the available evidence? Well, that's a decision you should be able to make for yourself, and I would encourage you to make that decision for yourself. Uh, and please realize, desperate people attract confidence men like flies. So you have to proceed with your eyes open and do your own due diligence. Uh, and remember also that uh, N equals 1, meaning a study with just one person or a case report, is really poor quality evidence. If you see a case report or a testimonial where someone was miraculously cured, I would suggest that your first thought should be uh, whether or not they've actually had the disease. There's a lot of other really cool things coming up uh, in medicine. This is not ready for prime time, but I'm really excited about it. CRISPR-Cas9 uh, and the coming gene therapy revolution. So it was mentioned in our previous talk. It's a system for editing DNA. And uh, it's relatively quick and accurate. And uh, we've already seen some results uh, in humans, but this is what's really exciting. This is a picture of Liz Parrish. She's the CEO of BioViva, and they're a company that's working on anti-aging uh, medicine. And she was the first patient in a trial of um, gene therapy. So she actually had herself injected with a uh, telomerase inhibitor and a myostatin inhibitor um, via the CRISPR-Cas9 technique. This was uh, performed in Colombia, and she reports feeling very healthy and well. So the preliminary results from this lead me to conclude that uh, her treatment was not catastrophic, uh, but uh, one can reasonably, that's all one can reasonably conclude. So um, her plans for going forward aren't well uh, described, but what's exciting is that people are bypassing all the regulatory hurdles in the United States and um, that they're accomplishing, uh, so, or at least that, that they're um, performing experiments, even if they're, um, at this point, very small experiments, wherever they're able to. So this is uh, just a slide to demonstrate one therapy in, uh, of a folostatin uh, gene inhibitor, which is much like what Liz Parrish injected herself with, and these were therapies uh, given to people with mus uh, children with muscular dystrophy. In Figure One here, let's see. Uh, um, we didn't just see the uh, the red lines uh, were the uh, baselines, and uh, the black lines were uh, post therapy measurements. And this is a six. Uh, a minute walk test, and this represents the distance people are able to walk. And what we can see is, in a progressively worsening uh, disease of muscle function, you had people 
who were increasing their six minute walk times. This is not what we're expecting to see. This is very early, very few patients, but it's promising, which is why I wanted to show it to you. So there are a lot of uh, different genetic targets for potentially anti-aging medicine or other purposes. I'm very excited about anti-aging medicine, and we're not gonna see that developed in the United States because the FDA doesn't consider aging a disease, so they're very unlikely to approve trials. But what we will see is gene therapies developed in the United States that then um, get adopted for things like anti-aging or performance enhancing purposes abroad. So I would just conclude with this uh, wonderful Shakespeare quote, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, that are dreamt of in your philosophy. What we have available to us on the healthcare menu in the United States is restricted. And if we restrict ourselves to the United States, I think we run a very substantial risk of having impaired life. So uh, the only good thing I will ever say about borders is that when you cross them, you can get away from an oppressive government. So uh, I hope you have learned a little bit about the possibilities for your own health abroad and uh, the wonderful things that can be accomplished when people search uh, for their own freedom. Thank you. Coenzyme Q10 in the treatment of uh, congestive heart failure. Um, it's, I'm actually not sure about the role of it. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm gonna have to look into it because the more and more I learn, the more I realize that, that my training is woefully uh, inadequate because it's restricted to what the professional societies and uh, the medical establishment recommends. Uh, His name is Folkers. Okay. And he did research on this and found that it had gained dramatic improvements in people with congestive Well, I'm certainly going to have to look that up because that's, uh, that's definitely worth knowing about. And again, there are a lot of things out there that your average doctor doesn't know about because it's not sanctioned by the medical gods in the United States, and it's a real shame. Uh, the, the, uh, the tests that uh, Mary mentioned for detecting cancer are things that were never taught to me in residency that I've never seen in any of the journals that I regularly read. And it's disturbing to me that that's the case. And maybe there's a reason for that. I'm going to go home and actually read about those and make up my own mind. But there are a lot of things out there that are probably very beneficial and useful, but that are just not part of the mainstream medical practice. I think he had his hand. Sir? I just wanted to relate a, a briefly about my oldest brother. He had a brain tumor, mm -hmm. and he, uh, at the end of last year, retired from uh, City Group, where he was their chief compliance officer. So you would think that his health insurance would have been able to pay, you know, except for the uh, deductible. He would have been able to afford to have the best quality surgery, and he was not. He was not able to make that happen in the United States. He went to India, mm -hmm. and the, the tumor was removed. It was completely successful, and he's a very healthy man right now, but he would be dead if it were not for medical therapy. Wow, that's a pretty remarkable story. And you know, the interesting thing about India, I was actually just a couple months ago talking to a cardiothoracic surgeon from India who told me about how she does surgeries, and she has general surgeons uh, who work for her. They will open the chest, get the patient ready. She comes in and does the cardiothoracic surgery portion. They close them up, they run it like a conveyor belt, and they uh, have, uh, according to their data, reduced complications and also dramatically reduced the cost. And the number of procedures she does dwarfs the number of procedures done even in top academic centers in the United States. Meaning, as I was mentioning earlier, they're probably a lot better at it. Ma'am? Yes. Are you, uh, would you speak to the National Institutes of Health and the research they do? Um, do you have a specific question about it? Um, no, I'm just looking for your opinion as to uh, how much they benefit the health system in the country. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, well, uh, 
So, so I mean, the first thing that came to mind was, uh, when you asked about that was uh, proposals that I've seen over the last couple of years to have the National Institutes of Health investigate gun violence. And I've always worried that that would become political. Uh, the National Institutes of Health have uh, tried uh, rather unsuccessfully to reassure the public about the safety of vaccines. I think the vaccines are very safe, but when something comes from the government, it is automatically suspect, as it should be. So can uh, they perform things like epidemiologic studies or look at, at specifics? Yes. However, I think uh, it's much better handled by the private sector. So I, I don't really see a legitimate role for the National Institute of Health uh, as a, a uh, as a government entity. Uh, I think the National Institute of Health has also uh, been promoting the food pyramid, which as was discussed earlier, is indeed quite toxic. Uh, and uh, he's probably responsible for a large portion of America's obesity epidemic. And this is what happens when you have central planning. The guy at the top gets a bad idea and kills off everyone. Um, that's American medicine. That's what we've done with diets in the United States. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mary.